let's go through um, the kinetic theory of gases. The exciting thing about the kinetic theory of gases is this goes all the way back to Boltzmann in 1877. So we'll see how that figures in and the, really the birth of quantum mechanics. And then we'll do thermal conductivity. So the kinetic theory of gases is needed for a lot of these transport concepts. And we're in a section of the course called transport phenomena. So we'll learn about what that means today. So let's dive in. So the main tenet of kinetic molecular theory is that energy, again, first law, not lost or, or uh, created or destroyed, but transferred. And in kinetic molecular theory, we are becoming atomists. There, there were scientists that were not atomists, meaning they didn't believe in atoms or particles. They thought nature was just a, more like pudding. You know, so mentally think about pudding. You know, you don't really have particles in pudding. Hopefully not. It's not like cottage cheese. Okay. So, um, so an, an atomistic view would be more like sand than pudding. Okay. So, uh, and so Boltzmann was a. Let's see. Yeah, Boltzmann was an atomist. Planck was not. And so, uh, Boltzmann treated the gases and, and the velocities of gases as if the gases were particles. Yeah. So the difference in that comparison would be seeing a rock and thinking that's a hunk of rock as opposed to seeing a rock and thinking, oh, you know, that's a hunk of a combination of, like, silica, basalt, and all this. Yeah, things. so not really thinking about the materials, but that rock was more like a polymer. Okay. You know, a polymer, even though you, we know it's made up of atoms, <laughs> but think about how it's all just smooshed, and it, it mushes and melts, and, you know, it's, um, it's hard for me not to be an atomist. You know, what is that? It's hard for me to think of that. Um, but mathematically, it's pretty easy. You just treat the center of mass of the material and its extent, and there are no boundaries between the material. There's no, it's just one homogeneous thing described by a state function. And so in engineering, a lot of times, the state functions are non-atomistic. They, they're just, they're just a, a, a function for that material and how it might deform or stretch or or eventually break, they won't be able to describe how it breaks. Um, if you want to get into actually studying how it breaks, where that crack's going to go, then you need to take, take that homogeneous material and break it into what they call finite elements. And so each little finite element has the properties of the whole, but they're, they each have their own little stresses, and you can see the material break. A finite element model still is not an atomistic model. <laughs> But you could take those finite elements down to the atoms, and then you'd have a, a, a sort of a, a convergence to the atomistic model. So engineering uses still these sort of broad equations, not treating individual atoms, but treating the material as a whole. So Boltzmann was, a, was an atomist talking about particles and relating the equipartition theorem of energy, see on the right, the translation of particles in space, 3 has RT, to just baseballs and cannonballs, one half mv squared. So they said, okay, let's set these together and we'll look at this velocity distribution related to temperature and the gas constant. And so this is uh, actually the, the particular equation we get for the root mean squared velocity of particles. And this is Graham's law that the rate of effusion uh, through a pinhole from a high concentration area to a vacuum or a low concentration area is proportional to this root mean square velocity. And this is from the freshman text. I and mean, we've seen this before. We calculate the different masses and so on. Because you have a temperature effect here, you have a mass effect, and you have this velocity. So this diffusion is not effusion. We're going to get into diffusion in this transport chapter. Diffusion is just spreading through a pinhole uh, uh, into a vacuum or a low concentration area. Diffusion is not through a particular location. It's just one material into another. So in all locations, like in a large area, diffusion. And it's covered in the transport chapter, which we're getting to. How are these molecular velocities um, measured? This is one of the main points of this morning's uh, talk was to just show this apparatus. It's really an ingenious little apparatus. So let's start over on the left for the, for the video. Let's do this. 
So over here we have a, a hot oven. We had one of these in, in grad school, the Knudsen cell, K-N-U-D-S-E-N, or Knudsen, I think it's E N. So this is a U. And it's just a little, ours was a little can with a hole in the side, and you could put your uh, material in there, and then this little tantalum can, you would stick between two copper electrodes and run a ton of current through it. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a little area of, uh, of, you know, resistance that really heats up. And so you can adjust the heat of that Knudsen cell by just adjusting the current that you're sending through it. And so you can evaporate metal in these things. I mean, you heat them up and then it's a liquid, you melted the metal and guess what is above the liquid? The vapor pressure. And so you've got a vapor pressure. If you put that in contact with a vacuum, then those metal atoms are going to come streaming out into that vacuum or gas or, you know, molecules, etc. Now this little area here, these are, um, these are called skimmers. These are slits to where you just want molecules going or atoms going in a single line. And so you just throw away all the ones that are off axis. And so then you have these atoms flying through here. And I love this because it's so simple. These rotating disks are turning at a particular speed. And so the slots, you see the slots are off by a certain angle. And so only when the velocity of this disk matches the velocity of the atom will it go through both slits and hit the detector. <laughs> and so it's just a filter. It'd be like driving a car and then, you know, this, uh, this gap comes through and you, you pass the first gap. And then if you're going exactly the perfect speed, the next gap shows up just in time for you to go through it. And if you're at any other speed, you hit the wall. Okay, so it's a filter, a velocity filter. And so how do you get different velocities? Well, you just move the gap. So you can move these disks relative to each other and you just sweep through you know, really, really close gap for really fast molecules that hit both of them very quickly, or move that gap around to where you get the slow molecules. And if you look at the signal on the detector, after you've swept this angle between the two disks, you get this plot. So if the, the gaps are close together, you get the high velocity atoms or molecules, and then if you move the gap around, you get the low ones, you get the slow molecules coming through and then you get this peak in the middle before you've got the average or average most probable or root mean squared average velocities and so this is the energy or velocity distribution and you know thermodynamics predicts this in fact Boltzmann this is the new bullet point for this week um, 1877 Boltzmann derived this curve using quantized energies isn't that crazy so in his paper in 1877, he used quantized energies, but he said in there as a caveat, he said, I'm just using quantized uh, velocities for um, mathematical simplicity. He said the, the series that I'm solving this for is essentially infinite. You've got a, a large number of molecules, and each one of those molecules can have a large number of velocities. So instead of solving this problem with an infinite range, we'll do a discrete sum. And he said, not that this would represent anything in nature. Okay, so he wasn't trying to become a quantum mechanic or say that quantum mechanics was was a thing or, or quantum theory was a thing. He just did it as a mathematical simplicity. But then his equation that was derived from using quantized energies, Max Planck looked at and, and eventually applied that to the black body irradiation problem. So it was pretty amazing. If you people say Max Planck was the father of quantum mechanics, but he got the idea from Boltzmann, and and that's what we're using this Boltzmann distribution all through the fall and the spring semester for what we mean by thermal equilibrium, and it it came from using quantized states to to match this velocity curve. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, what do we see with velocity? Uh, if you see a higher temperature, you have higher velocities on average. You still have some really low and slow molecules, okay, but you've got more um, faster molecules. So at a given temperature, you have some of everything. You've got even at cold temperature, you've got some fast molecules and you've got some slow ones.
it depends upon mass as well, which we'll see in a second. So this is the this little U shown here. This is from the freshman text where they used U because they didn't want to introduce Greek characters. And so this velocity, root mean square velocity, is what's being shown here. And so these are two different temperatures. Notice that the root mean squared velocity is not at the high point. Okay, that would be the most probable velocity. But notice that this curve is not symmetric. It skews to the right. And so in order to kind of capture those higher um, velocities, the root mean squared velocity is, is a little higher than the most probable velocity. Here's the mass dependence. And so if you're using this equation to do a unit analysis, you would use the uh, molar mass in kilograms per mole so that it would cancel with the, with the joule and the gas constant. Okay. So it's all about the units. Look how, as we go from a heavy uh, molecule like oxygen all the way down to, to dihydrogen, this is the lightest one. So these are all at the same, uh, the same temperature. This is just a mass effect. And so hydrogen is so light, look how much, how, how uh, many more fast molecules of hydrogen there are at a given temperature than there are slow. Whereas here, oxygen, it's most, compare that oxygen to the hydrogen. You know, that's quite amazing in terms of the mass. <coughs> okay. What would this tell us later on about thermal conductivity? Hydrogen is a much more thermally conductive gas than oxygen because how is temperature um, transmitted from one wall to the other through collisions and so hydrogen has a lot higher velocity so it's going to collide more and uh, get around and uh, transfer that heat. Okay, I've started this slide because there's some homework questions about it and uh, these are the three different types of what we call figures of merit in terms of velocity. So there's the m most probable, which is the very top of the curve, the most probable velocity. Then there's the average velocity, and even the average is not high enough sort of to represent the curve, so there's also the root mean squared velocity. So these are the three different equations that you can use. Uh, different transport coefficients depend upon different velocities and a lot of them depend upon the average velocity. So make sure you're using, if you're going to calculate these things, make sure you're using the correct velocity equation because they're slightly different. One is 3 RT over M, the other is 8 RT over pi. Okay. So it's kind of like instead of uh, factor 3, it's, almost, it's like a, not quite 3, it's 8, eight over 3. Okay. Uh, or up there, most probable, even smaller, is just 2. RT over M. Also, and we, we get into uh, the transport chapter, some of the terms that we use are the mean free path. And so it's the average distance a particle travels before it collides with another particle. And again, it's average. Some are going to hit immediately. Some are going to go a lot further than you might think before they hit something. But what's the average? What's the mean free path a particle would take at a given pressure at a given temperature, with a certain size particles, how far could it go before it collides with something? Okay, it's kind of a neat calculation if you think about it. How much space does the particle have to move around before it runs into something? I kind of think of this: how crowded is the dance floor? Right? If you go on, say, Thursday night, which I don't know, I don't go out anymore, but when I was in college, you go on Thursday night, the dance floor is pretty crowded. Your mean free path may be a half a foot. You know, you move a little bit and you bump into somebody. You go on a Tuesday night, you know, you got 12 foot <laughs> mean free path, much lower pressure. So this is the collisional frequency and mean free path calculations. The Z11 and Z12 are collisional frequency calculations, and that would be um, the uh, frequency for, for 1, 1 would be particle 1 colliding with other particle 1s. And then if you have two, two or more gases, particle 1 colliding with particle 2 would be Z12. And uh, for our sakes, Z12 and Z21 are going to be the same. Okay. And then if you had that situation, you'd also have a Z22 uh, collision. And so you have the different masses. Notice here this is mass 1. For Z22, it would be mass 2. For uh, the 1 to 2 collision, you have the reduced mass here. Okay, and so those are the collision frequencies, and then this lambda is the mean free path. 
And notice it's the average velocity, not the root mean squared. So the average velocity over the collision rates. And if you just have one type of particle, this C12 disappears, and so you end up with just this, the average velocity over the collision rate. And so we'll calculate this for, for a particular system. So what are the mean free path and collisional frequencies of argon gas at one atmosphere at room temperature? So we're very familiar with one atmosphere. This is what we're in right now. Uh, we're familiar with room temperature. So this would be argon in this room at this pressure, at this temperature. Uh, how far could it go before it hits another argon atom? And how many collisions does it have per second? Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. We would look up the information about the the collisional cross-section, so the radius of argon, we could look up that. That one actually would be the atomic radius uh, for argon. It's very small, 10 to the minus 19 meters squared would be that cross-sectional area. Um, it depends on the volume, or we could convert that volume over to pressure, you know, using, uh, using the ideal gas law, using pressure. So we have the um, gas constant, the temperature, converting over to uh, get out of moles from the gas constant and then using the pressure in its, uh, in its SI units of Pascal's, we end up with our mean free path of being 80 nanometers. Not very far. So argon atom may be like a um, 0.2 nanometer diameter, roughly. So it's, um, it's going to go you know, 80 nanometers on average before it hits another one. So it does have a lot of space to run around in. So it's, uh, what is that, 80, like 400 of its diameters to run around in or more. Okay. So if you were to see, you know, if you were to put yourself in the shoes of an argon atom, you'd, you'd have whatever your diameter is, 400 of those to run around in. I mean, you're going to bump into them, but, you know, you've got some space. It's not elbow to elbow. Okay. Uh, let's look at those collisional frequencies. So it's uh, 5 billion collisions per second. Now I've got 400 diameters to move around in. How is it that I'm colliding with something uh, 5 billion times per second? It's because I'm really moving. <laughs> okay, this is faster than any dance I've ever seen. So at room temperature, that argon is really moving around. Uh, it, it hits something every 200 picoseconds. So just to give you an idea of what kind of collisional frequencies we have, it's about a billion collisions per second. That's related to our speed of sound. Right? That's how come we can communicate with words because of the collisional frequency, the compression waves that are coming from my vocal cords are getting to your ears at 728 miles per, uh, miles per hour. So that's pretty amazing how fast sound travels through material and it's because of these collisions. So that's kind of, I think this is neat stuff. It's just to think about the world around us and that's just a gas. You know, sound travels faster in a solid because they're closer together. I mean, free path is much smaller. Collisions are up higher, you know. So, so let's go on uh, then to the transport chapter. And so when we talk about transport, this is a whole course in engineering. As you know, many of these topics like the statistical thermodynamics, that's a whole course. So we're hitting a, a lot of different topics in this, in this particular course. And this would be one where you would, if you were in an engineering program, you would have a whole course on transport. Because there are different types of transport. There's matter, energy, momentum, and charge, to name four. And so we have uh, diffusion of, of one molecule in an, into another. So think about a candle. If I light a candle up here, it's got some nice vanilla smell to it, which is my favorite. And that's going to diffuse through the room. And so that's the vanilla molecule being evaporated by the heat from the flame, and it diffuses through the room. So that's transport of matter. That molecule is making its way throughout the room. Uh, energy, thermal conductivity, the heat from that candle. 
is going to be radiated through the room and somehow moved throughout. And then momentum, linear momentum, viscosity is a measurement of transport of linear momentum. So flow through a pipe, when we get to the viscosity part, that's going to be the main equation that we, that we deal with is, is flow equations. And then we will we typically don't have enough time to cover everything, so we won't really get into ionic con conductivity, but it's in the, it's in the books. You can, if you're interested in that, go on. So the central concept of transport is flux. So you've heard about the flux capacitor and all that business. You've heard the term flux, okay, if you've seen Back to the Future. Um, it's not really related to that. Flux is just flow, okay? And, it, and it, it's movement in, in opposite direction to the gradient. So we need to define two terms, the gradient and the flux. And so looking at this box, you can see there's more particles on the left than on the right. And it's all about definitions. How do, what, what direction do we draw this arrow? Okay. We always look uphill when we're dealing with the gradient. Okay. So we're looking uphill towards where the most molecules are. And so that's the direction of the gradient. It's uphill. Do you understand what I mean by uphill? There's more particles over here than over here. And so you draw the arrow, the gradient, towards the higher amount. Now, it won't always be particles. It could be energy. So if this was the hot side and the cold side, which side has more joules of energy? The hot side. And so the gradient goes up to the hot side. Okay. And I use up and down because we're familiar with balls rolling downhill. Okay, flux is in opposition of the gradient. So the flux vector goes in the opposite direction as the gradient. So if we're looking at matter being on one side of the box, the gradient goes in that direction, uphill towards the most matter, and then the flux goes downhill towards the least matter. So flux is always in response to the gradient. If the gradient is higher, the flux will be greater. Think about water in a river. If it, you know, the velocity of that water is moving downhill very quickly. And so this this little alpha here, so we have this derivative of the property with respect to x, okay, so we're looking at, uh, you know, in this case, matter versus x, so here's x-axis, so this property is high over here, low over here, so it's uphill, so positive slope going that direction, then we have the flux vector in opposite direction, so that's the minus sign, and then this alpha is the transport coefficient, and this whole section of the note is studying what those alphas are those transport coefficients. Because there's a different kind for diffusion, there's one for thermal conductivity, there's one for ionic conductivity, there's one for all of the different gradients that we calculated, there's a, a different transport coefficient. And we'll see that uh, they explain a lot of the things that, that we deal with on a daily basis. So there's three ways to, to transport energy. There's collisional, so random particles colliding with their nearest neighbors. Okay. Can you think of the other two? Or do you don't look at the notes. Okay. What are some of the others? We've got these brand new ovens out now. Not, they're not typically new, but, but homes are starting to get them standard. Uh, like what, kind, what are your options in buying an oven for the house? Do you know yet? I know you haven't bought houses yet. Sure. Mm -hmm. Convection oven, yeah. So that's the next one, convective. So convection oven is non-random flow of currents. So currents, you know, generated by a fan. In fact, our all of our GC ovens are convection ovens. You hear that fan come on when it's starting to heat up? It's got a heating element in the back and a fan that blows that hot air over the, over the column. Because it doesn't want to wait for random collisions of particles to warm up that that uh, 30 meter glass tube, the capillary GC, it wants to force that to come to thermal equilibrium. And so it's circulating the air in a non-random way. It's pumping that heat into that box. And the box is insulated. And then lastly, it's radiative. So emission of radiation from hot molecules and absorption by cold molecules. And so this is key here. We assume the last two are small for our problems in transport. So this transport coefficient and Everything that we're talking about is just collisional. 
So particles randomly colliding with their nearest neighbors. But yet we use the other two quite a bit. Like we use convection ovens for cooking. That's what these air fryers are too. The little air fryers, new things. They've got a heating element and a fan. And they blow that hot air over your food and it cooks very quickly. Because you're not waiting for this um, diffusion, you know, uh, particles, not, I shouldn't you say diffusion, but for particles just to collide and transfer the heat. Uh, radiative um, heat transport is uh, important in things like grilling food. A lot of times the, the radiative heat is what's cooking the food. Um, uh, broiling, you know, in an oven, you have the heating element on the top, you set it to broil, put the food really close, there's a lot of infrared that's cooking the top of your food, and it'll, it'll crisp the outside, and if you want a rare steak, you put it on a broiler. And then radiative, if you've ever been to a campfire, and you're sitting by the campfire, and your face is really burning, and you put your hands in front of your face, and your face immediately gets cool, that can't be collisional or convective, because the you would have hot gases flowing over your face. You block that radiation and your face feels cool, you're, you're blocking the radiative heat. So the hot coals are just blasting infrared at your face. And if you just block it, your face cools down, you're dealing with radiative heat. So radiative heat can be blocked. The other two, it's difficult to block these two because the particles will collide and go around the barrier. So let's talk about this ideal thermal flux. It depends upon particle velocity and mean free path. And so this looks really ugly, but it's not that bad. So in terms of thermal flux, we have our gradient, which is the change in temperature with respect to x. And so that gradient vector would be going uphill towards the hot temperature, and then the flux would be in the opposite direction, so going downhill. And then this is the, the um, transport coefficient the thermal conductivity. And so that's that's given right here by this by this equation. And so here it depends upon the, the um, heat capacity at constant volume, which we know how to calculate and know which type of molecule are we doing it for, for this right now. Three halves R that would be a monatomic gas. Okay. If we had a diatomic, it would be 5 halves R, et cetera. So we're you know, using those same skills. This N with the tilde on top, that's the number density. So we call that number density. Okay. And that's the number of molecules per... Uh, per volume. And so it's particles per volume. Uh, instead of moles, it's particles per volume. So you could use Avogadro's number divided by the molar volume. You could use the pressure, um, you know, Avogadro's number and, and, and R and T. So you could put these here and, and have it be related to the pressure and the temperature. Putting all those terms in, several things cancel, and so this would be our our transport coefficient written in terms of pressure and temperature. And you still need the uh, average velocity and this mean free path. And so let's calculate what the thermal conductivity for argon is at room temperature, or roughly room temperature, 300 Kelvin and one atmosphere. In order for the units to work out, you'd want to use uh, the SI units for pressure, so pascals. It's a newton per square meter or a joule per cubic meter. Same, same number, same numerical value. The average velocity that we calculated before and the mean free path that we calculated before. And so this is our thermal conductivity for argon. And so it's got an interesting unit. It's watts per Kelvin per meter. So you've got a distance. You've got a, a temperature. It's really like a temperature difference because that's the gradient. And it's how many joules per second are flowing. So it's, you've got a temperature gradient in Kelvin 
you've got a distance, okay, so that's that slope, and then you've got the, the flow, which is watts. In this case, the flow is watts because it's joules per second. We're talking about energy being transferred. And so this energy migrates in response to that thermal gradient, thermal gradient, and this is incredibly important for your home. So just look at all the different things in your home that set up thermal differences. We have refrigerators, air conditioners, heaters, water heaters, clothes dryers. So there's a lot of heat sources in our home. Uh, we want the heat to do what it's supposed to do, like cook our food, and not heat up the room. We have other devices for that. Okay and the stove and the oven, about 67% of our consumption is in these heating and cooling devices. And lighting is only about 9%. So even though it's a good idea to turn the lights out, that's really not gonna save you that much. <laughs> I wish I had this data when my mom was always fussing at me for not turning the lights out. Only 9% savings. So I get smacked. Okay. Yeah, curly lights are a good idea. And replacing them all in your house is great, um, but uh, it's really not going to make an enormous difference on your energy bill. I hate to, to pop that bubble. Um, they are nice, though. I do like the light that they give off, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hating on them. But if you think you're going to cut your energy in half uh, by replacing your, your uh, incandescent bulbs with the curly bulbs, you're not going to cut it in half, unless you absolutely don't have a fridge or AC, <laughs> you don't use your clothes dryer, yeah. If, you know, if all you're living is in a, in, a, in a box with a few lights, then yeah, you may cut your energy in half. But most normal homes have stoves and fridges, and, and at least here in Texas. Okay, so that 30% of your consumption is just due to heat. Um, so here's all the places where we lose energy in our homes. A lot of it to the attic. And then the heat's going into the attic in cold uh, times of the year and coming in from the attic in, in the, the hot times of the year. So this, these arrows can change direction. Again, flux will change based upon the gradient. So uh, we also have, uh, you know, holes in our walls where things, you know, heat can flow through, air leaking in and out, et cetera. So one way to stop this is to insulate. Notice we insulate all the out or uh, external surfaces. We don't really insulate between rooms. Uh, it just saves money by only insulating where you need to insulate. But the, the thickest insulation in the attic, sometimes up to two feet of insulation in the attic, because again, that, the sun is, is beating down on the roof and heating that up like crazy. And down here, you know, this, this might be um, under that tar shingle, you know, well over you know 100 120 degrees and in here we want to keep this at a nice 68 or 72 degrees and we're dealing in fahrenheit and so that's a big thermal gradient from from here to there and so we need some kind of barrier that that prevents that uh that flux and lowers it for hotter states why wouldn't you want like white shingles there are, you can get uh, like metal roofs with a white coating. Uh, a lot of it's driven by aesthetics, even though it costs money, you know. And, and you can also put a radiant barrier underneath the, the shingles. And that's a, like a mylar reflective coating. Infrared energy is reflected by smooth surfaces, not necessarily by shiny surfaces. So if a surface is smooth, it acts like a mirror in the infrared. Now shiny works as well, but they can put what they call a radiant or reflective barrier under the shingles. And so the shingles heat up, the infrared tries to go into the attic and it hits that barrier and is reflected back. Okay. And, and so it just bounces the energy back out into the sky. What that does is it really heats up your shingles. And so it could take like a 30 year shingle and make it a 15 year shingle. <laughs> and so, yeah, you save money on your energy, but you're gonna to have to buy a new roof. The roof's gonna last half as long. So it's really weird how some of this economically works out. Um, you know, I wanted to get a radiant barrier and they were like, oh, we don't wanna do that because you know, you're gonna, this roof that we're gonna to try to guarantee for 20 years is only gonna last 10. Starts to dry out and crack. 
and so on. So that's, there's just a lot of calculations that happen. So we did this in the 70s, uh, the energy crisis during Carter's years. Uh, there was enormous push to insulate homes and improve and to seal them. Everybody's putting little sealant around their doors, these little foam pads to keep the doors from being drafty and so on. And then we noticed an uptick in cancer. Like, what happened? We're lung cancers. So what would you think happened? Asbestos. Yeah, maybe asbestos. Okay, some of the insulating materials might be asbestos, but it's more for fireproofing. But still, there might be some chemical in the stuff that we're putting around our doors and windows. Uh, double pane windows showed up. That was a big push for that. Um, but it was regional. And we discovered that when we sealed our homes, we made them traps for radon. Not so much in Texas, but in the Northeast, Montana, places in New Mexico, where there's, there's uh, uranium in the soil, it decays to radon. It decays to a lot of things, and we'll cover that in the last fifth of the course. But uh, the decay products from uranium, uh, one of them is radon. Now, the nice thing about a noble gas is it doesn't bond with anything, right? But in this case, that's a bad thing, because as soon as that daughter product from uranium turns into radon, all of the oxide bonds and everything that was holding that in the rock are broken because that radon's happy. It's got a noble gas configuration and it percolates through the rock and gets up into the basement of these houses and we've sealed our houses and so the radon concentration grows in these basements and that's where the laundry is. And you go down there and do your laundry and you're breathing in radon gas, which is not toxic in a sense that doesn't do anything chemically in the body but it gets in your lungs and then it bad luck right it decays right there and turns into polonium and so on and you got all these radioactive nuclides in your body now uh, because the radon happened to decay while it was in your lungs <coughs> so then you have increase in lung cancers they said up to 14 percent of the lung cancers were due to radon so then they started putting radon monitors in the basement and so you can up in the Places where there's this is a problem, there'll be a little can in the bottom with a little, you know, film, I guess, and they, they read it occasionally and, and they have ventilation and they, they blow that radon gas out. Okay. So, something you wouldn't expect. It's really that. So, thermal insulation, vacuum is best. Uh, heavy trapped gas. So, in your double pane windows, you do not want to put hydrogen in there or helium because that's not a heavy gas and it has such a high velocity it's going to transport the heat from one side to the other very efficiently helium especially hydrogen's even better okay you want a heavy trapped gas heavier the better radon probably not great so don't use radon but that would be great for thermal product properties but not good for radioactivity uh, you know what's the next option um, xenon would be great too expensive okay krypton okay maybe but argon's golden because it's 1% of our atmosphere. So very, on, on a scale of noble gases, argon's a sweet spot. It's dirt cheap. Okay, so they will actually take these double pane windows, evacuate the space and refill it with argon, seal it up. And it lasts for a while, but eventually the argon, it'll be a seal that cracks and there'll be a communication with the outer, outer you know, atmosphere and water will move in and your windows fog from the inside. And that's where my windows are right now. It's sad. You look at them and you can see this moisture or residue on the inside of the windows. There's no way to clean it. It's between the double panes. And it's because they eventually leak. And aerogels, like the space shuttle tiles, that's a fantastic insulation. It's a solid material, but it has the transport properties, the transport coefficient of a gas. It's pretty amazing. And like this show these pictures that's a great photo so this aerogel is on a ring stand and they've got a blue you know butane torch blowing on the bottom and it's insulating those matches now eventually they'll light but you know it's like the space show coming in from the atmosphere thousands of degrees on the outside of those tiles and a habitable zone on the inside so it's pretty cool stuff and then foams and fibrous materials and non-dense solids. So density is a big thing. Here's a nice little table from this uh, physics hypertextbook that shows the thermal conductivity uh, values for various materials. You see up here vacuum zero, air 0.025, it's 
it's roughly what we calculated for argon. Um, helium, look at that, really conducts compared to air. It's almost five times more conductive. Um, I don't know about this number for mylar. I don't know why it would be so low. So I, I've got a question mark on that one. Um, but, uh, that silica aerogel, again, very similar to just air. Okay. Compare that to copper, 400. <laughs> So that's why we make our heat sinks out of copper or aluminum. Copper is better than aluminum. Aluminum is 237. Copper is 401. Where's is mercury on here? Yeah, 8.34, which I thought it would be higher than that. But anyway. So it's kind of interesting to see the different materials in their thermal transport coefficients. Now, if you buy insulation for your home, you're going to deal with R value, so I just put this in here just to help you uh, convert from kappa to, to R. So kappa is down here. If you have a, a fast transport or a high transport coefficient, you're going to have a low R value. If you have a, a small transport coefficient, you'll have a high R value. So vacuum would be zero here and an infinite R. So if you had a vacuum in your attic, you would not have at least collisional transport from your shingles to the top of your house. It'd be hard to seal that up and keep a vacuum, but <laughs> really expensive home. But uh, essentially you'd be living in a door. That'd be kind of cool, <laughs> maybe. And then, uh, but you still have radiative. And so you'd have radiative, uh, there's no gases in there, so you wouldn't have convection, but you would uh, definitely have radiative. And so that's pretty much it. There's different, you know, websites you can go to to learn about insulation for your home, but it's all in this thermal transport. We, we're, when we're insulating, we're trying to stop thermal conductivity. And so this is directly related to what we do uh, every day in our homes and so on. So that's it. And uh, Wednesday is that critical thinking test and Friday I'll be back. So all goes well. <laughs>